they got to keep the kitchen gallon as well. Okay, can somebody confirm you can hear me? Yes. Uh, Allison, are you trying to talk? You need to unspeak your uh, microphone because I don't hear anything. Yes, we can hear you. Oh, wait a minute. Maybe that's my problem. My speaker is off. Why is that speaker off? All right, let's try that again. Can somebody confirm you can hear me? Yes. Thank you. All right, today is May 9th. Sorry for being a little bit late. I uh, just got in and discovered it was this late. I didn't think it was that late. Um, my clock in my car has got to be reset. Um, so May 9th, sorry, I said May 8th. Uh, we should be starting microbial growth. I don't think we're there yet. Let me check on uh, chapter five. I don't think we've finished chapter five. And then there will be a lecture tonight, lab eight. Any questions about what we're doing? I'm not showing my screen, am I? All right, come on. There we go. You should be seeing my screen now. Let's close that. I notice I have a lot of emails. I haven't looked at my emails today. At least not yet. Um, let me start by saying I did a fair amount of grading over the weekend. Uh, let me stop sharing my screen. I'll bring up the... Uh, grade book. So I don't remember what... Uh, I graded. I graded the last lecture worksheet and the last lab the first time. I remember that. Uh, I think I got one of the quizzes graded. Let's move to the quizzes first. Yeah, I got quiz 1A graded. I'm working on quiz 2A, but haven't gotten very far. Uh, I got the, uh, yeah, worksheet lab seven graded the first time and worksheet lab four graded the second time. Uh, maybe worksheet lab three graded the second time. So all labs are graded the first time. Uh, let me see when I got lab six graded. Uh, lab six was graded sometime this week. And for the second turning in, you have until May 13th to uh, submit us a lab six again. So both lab six and lab seven will be due this Saturday. Let me go back to lab five just to make sure about that one. Yeah, lab five, I need to grade the second one. And then the last lecture worksheet was graded. And that would be a worksheet lecture five. There was something I wanted to talk to you about and I don't remember what it was. I think it was on one of the quizzes. I think it was quiz 1A. I was surprised at how many students got. I think it was the first question wrong. Let me go there. Yeah. 
guess that'll work. Guess I'm not showing my screen. Why is the wearing of sandals and open-toed shoes not allowed in the lab? In microbiology, the main concern is dropping cultures, bacteria cultures on your feet. And especially if it's liquid cultures, it'd be a problem, but even a plate, if you drop that on your feet, we wouldn't want you to get bacteria on your toes. Uh, and shoes don't give much protection, but they give a lot more protection than an open-toed shoes. We do not really have any sharps and we don't often use glass in the lab. So uh, sharp objects being dropped isn't a problem. And we don't really use or hardly use hazardous chemicals. So we're not really worried about your dropping chemicals on your feet either. Those are some of the other answers. And in other labs, you know, this is a concern where you're using sharps like a scalpel or a needle. We don't use those in microbiology. And we don't really use hazardous chemicals. About the most hazardous chemical we use is the um, ingredients of the gram stain. Mm -hmm. which if that drops on your toes, I'm not going to be worried at all, your naked toes even. If you were to get it in your eye, it would be bad, or in your mouth, especially if you swallowed it. But generally on your skin, uh, those chemicals won't be a problem. So that was one. There was another question too. Let me see if I can find it. Oh, how are the domains defined? Uh, I mentioned this in class, and I don't know if people are going online or they're just looking it up someplace else, but there were a lot of wrong answers. The domains are defined by the sequence of their DNA, and they usually sequence the rRNA genes, but sometimes they sequence the uh, tRNA gene as well. These genes are in, in all organisms, and that's why they use uh, those genes like if they do the eye color gene, well, most animals don't have the eye color gene. So, and then obviously plants don't have eyes, so uh, you can't make the comparison. But with the rRNA genes, you can compare all organisms, all living life forms by the sequence of their DNA. And if somebody said the sequence of rRNA, that would be correct too, because uh, not rRNA. If somebody said RNA, that would be correct too, because like I said, it's mostly the rRNA gene that we sequence and then determine where an organism lives. Now, this is the modern classification system, okay? That's not the older system that used to be used in microbiology. And as I mentioned, a number of microbiologists have been hesitant about throwing away the older microbiology system. But once they die, the older system will go away. And then we'll use the modern classification system based on the DNA sequence to determine the domain. Any questions about any of those? All right, I wanted to mention those because so many people got those question is wrong. All right, I started opening lecture five. Let me share my screen again. Why do I open this? But Oh, there it is. Let's see where we are in... Uh, Chapter five. I've got that we finished talking about aerobic respiration. Is that con correct? Anyone? Can anyone confirm this is where we are?
All right. I'm not hearing anything. I'm not sure why that is the case. Um, can people hear me? Yes, and I believe that's where we're at. Okay, thank you. All right, let's briefly talk about anaerobic respiration. Anaerobic respiration is generally the same as aerobic respiration. That's not always the case, but in most cases it is, meaning anaerobic respiration usually has glycolysis, the Krebs cycle, and then the electron transport chain. It's just the electron transport chain is different. It's usually a little sm smaller than in aerobic respiration, and it has a different final electron acceptor where the electrons do not end up at oxygen. They end up at some other inorganic molecule like nitrate, sulfate, because the electron transport chain is a little shorter, anaerobic respiration yields less ATP than, an, uh, than aerobic respiration. The yield of anaerobic respiration depends upon what form of anaerobic respiration it is, but the yield is always between 2 ATP per glucose molecule to 36 ATP per glucose molecules. Because the yield of ATP is less than in aerobic respiration, anaerobes tend to grow slower than aerobes. Any question about that? All right, that's it for anaerobic respiration. Let's briefly talk about fermentation. It starts out with glycolysis, and glycolysis is how fermentation generates its ATP. And then the uh, glycolysis is followed by one or two chemical reactions that are the fermentation step of fermentation. But fermentation does include glycolysis. Any question about any of that? So in fermentation, we do generate some ATP, but not much. We only generate two ATP per molecule of glucose. Any questions? And those two ATP are generated in glycolysis. They're not generated in the fermentation step. In fermentation, you switch the glucose to two pyruvic acids. You do get a net gain of two ATP. You do generate one NADH. Now in fermentation, let me see if I can blow this up. We have glycolysis. Those NADH are used to convert the pyruvic acid to the fermentation end product. And that can be different end products depending on which type of fermentation there is. There's five or six different fermentation end products. Now our muscle cells can use fermentation to make ATP when oxygen becomes limiting. And that happens when the muscle is working heavily and the blood and the heart and the lungs are unable to get enough oxygen to the muscle. Rather than to start working because there's no ATP, the muscle falls back on fermentation. And with glucose, we generate two ATP. Uh, we use in our muscles lactic acid fermentation. And the NADH, which is generated in glycolysis, is then used in the fermentation step. 
to make uh, change pyruvic acid into lactic acid. Uh, why do you think the muscle cell uses up this NADH to make lactic acid, where if the muscle cell were to just keep NADH around, uh, eventually oxygen would come to the muscle cell, and then the NADH could be passed on to the electron transport chain, and you generate a lot more than two ATP that you generate from fermentation. Can anyone guess why the muscle cell uses up this NADH in fermentation? Come on, people. Nobody's going to guess? I will tell you on this one, because it is kind of important. Um, the NADH is used up to create NAD+. Plus. If you don't have any NA, NAD+, plus in the cell, you cannot perform glycolysis. And then you will not generate the 2 ATP. Okay? So that's why the muscle cell doesn't just store the NADH. Because if it were to store the NADH, it would generate more ATP by the electron transport chain of aerobic respiration. And as I stated, the muscle cells, actually the muscle cells are the only cells in the body that can perform fermentation. They prefer, like all of your cells, to perform aerobic respiration. But if the muscle is working heavily, especially heavily for a long period of time, it will run out of oxygen in which case the muscle cannot perform aerobic respiration to make ATP. And the um, electrons don't flow to oxygen because there's no oxygen around. That'll just back up all of the steps of aerobic respiration. And sooner or later, even glycolysis will stop because... Uh, uh, you either will run out of NAD plus or you'll run out of glucose and then glycolysis will stop. But in fermentation, the uh, cell, as long as there is uh, glucose, can perform fermentation and then the muscle can continue working because you are making a little ATP. In every Olympics, we usually see about one Olympic athlete push themselves to the limits where not only do they run out of oxygen, but they also run out of glucose because glucose is supplied by the blood and the heart and the lungs are working like mad to get the blood and the glucose and the oxygen to the muscle. But the muscle is using it up faster than it's being delivered. And in which case, fermentation cannot happen because there's no glucose. And then the athlete just literally collapses Hopefully you remember seeing that on the Olympic athlete. In the wintertime, the coach runs out and throws a blanket over the Olympic athlete. I'm not sure what they do. Maybe in the Summer Olympics, they come out and spray the athlete with a water bottle. And then the Olympic athlete has the uh, heart and the lung working like mad, bringing blood to the muscle. And so glucose and oxygen are delivered. And then the uh, Olympic athlete can walk, get up and walk and cross the finish line uh, because they are making ATP, mostly by uh, aerobic respiration. Any questions about any of that? All right, there are two fermentation reactions you should know, lactic acid fermentation, where peruvic or per peruvate or peruvic acid is converted in one step to lactic acid. Uh, not only do our muscle cells use this, but a lot of other organisms use it, including organisms uh, that create sauerkraut, yogurt, sourdough bread, or at least some of the parts of sourdough bread, uh, many of other, other fermented foods like most cheeses, like cheddar cheese. 
Uh, lactic acid helps to prevent food spoilage. Sauerkraut, if you don't know, uh, can last a long time, even if you don't refrigerate it. Oops, didn't mean to do that. Oh, come on. Uh, the other fermentation reaction you should know is alcoholic fermentation, where the pyruvic acid is converted into uh, ethanol. This takes two steps. And CO2 will be generated because pyruvic acid is a three-carbon molecule. Uh, ethanol is a two-carbon molecule. And that CO2 coming off gives beer its fuzz or bit a uh, bubble, what do you call it, fuzz. And if you, uh, in wine, you don't get the, uh, the uh, bubble because it's made in an open casket or an open barrel and so the co2 just uh, goes to the air but if you were to make the wine in a bottle and cap the bottle we call it champagne and that's why champagne is bubbly okay any question about any of that uh, alcoholic fermentation is how we make leavened bread with uh, yeast uh it is true that uh, with sourdough bread, it's using both alcoholic fermentation and uh, lactic acid fermentation. So it's using both fermentation reactions. There are a couple of other fermentation reactions. Like I said, uh, the two most common are yeast doing ethanol to make our eth alcoholic fermentation or ethanolic fermentation. Uh, which we use for making beer and wine and yeast bread. That's why the the bread with yeast is uh, leavened, why it's raised because of the production of CO2. Uh, and then uh, lactic acid fermentation, like I said, for most cheeses like cheddar cheese and sauerkraut, even chocolate, is fermented. Most fermented foods is lactic acid fermentation. One exception is, uh, you don't need to know the type, but proponic acid uh, fermentation, that's how Swiss cheese is made. It generates CO2, and that's what uh, why Swiss cheese has uh, bubbles or holes in it, okay? There are a few other fermentation reactions, like uh, we use this in industry, clostridium, makes a number of fermentation products. Uh, acetone, butanol, we use that to make those two products. Uh, e. coli and salmonella uh, make a number of fermentation products like acetic acid, which we use to make vinegar. And then ethanol or enterobacter, which also makes ethanol. I read that wrong. Oh, no, that's acetic acid. That is the one. Uh, anyway, so uh, uh, we use these to make certain products like the ethanol we put in our gasoline when we drive. Uh, the only two fermentation react reactions you should know are lactic acid fermentation and ethanolic fermentation. Any questions about fermentation? All right, these are, uh, you don't need to know this table, just showing you some of the different fermentation end products, the industrial use, why we use ethanol, uh, making beer, wine, the ethanol in our car, acetic acid fermentation, making vinegar, lactic acid fermentation, most, making most fermented foods, the exception is Swiss cheese. There's citric acid fermentation, which we use for making flavoring. All right, any questions about any of these? All right, showing you a summary table, aerobic respiration, anaerobic respiration, comparing it to fermentation. The growth conditions, aerobic must be under aerobic growth, meaning oxygen has to be present. Anaerobic respiration, uh, generally is done without oxygen, but it it uh, does not use oxygen, does not need oxygen. And then fermentation, 
can be aerobic or anaerobic. The final electron acceptor for aerobic respiration is oxygen. The final electron acceptor for anaerobic respiration is a molecule, some other molecule other than oxygen. I'm talking about an inorganic substance. Fermentation, it's an organic molecule. You don't need to know that. Most of the time, it's actually pyruvate, which takes the electron. And then the generation of ATP, you don't need to know about that one. Uh, for ATP, for eukaryotes, we get 36 to 38 ATP molecules for aerobic respiration, depending on what cell it is. For prokaryotes, we get 38 ATP molecules per molecule of glucose. For anaerobic respiration, it's more than two, but fewer than 38. And then fermentation, you only get two ATP per molecule of glucose. Any questions apart about uh, fermentation or uh, respiration? Respiration is both anaerobic and aerobic respiration. All right, carbohydrate is generally used as the food source for providing energy, and microbes do this as well as people. However, microbes and other organisms, including people, can use other molecules, such as proteins and lipids. There is a problem that large molecules cannot Across the cell membrane, and both our cells and microbes deal with this by uh, making secreting enzymes extracellularly, and then digesting the large molecules outside the cell, and that's with lipases and proteases, making the monomers which for proteins would be amino acids, we can then move across the cell membrane utilizing a transport protein and uh, come into the cell. And then the cell can use that for respiration, usually aerobic respiration, at least in people. Um. I want to say here, I will say that in amino acids, you have to remove the amino group. And then the remaining part of the amino acid is used in some part of the Krebs cycle. I think the slide shows it here. Let me blow that up. So for carbohydrates, usually they're broken down into sugars. The sugar is then converted into glucose, and then glucose enters aerobic respiration in the normal fashion, starting with glycolysis. For proteins, uh, they can be, depending on which amino acid it is, converted into pyruvic acid in uh, glycolysis, and then uh, entering the Krebs cycle, or they can be uh, broken down into a substrate of uh, the Krebs cycle. For lipids, the glycerol, uh, the lipids are broken down into the glycerol and the fatty acids. The glycerol joins glycolysis midway through. The fatty acids are broken into two carbon chunks convert it into acetyl coenzyme A, and then generate, uh, enter the Krebs cycle in the normal way. The point is, is that all food items, proteins, carbohydrates, lipids, as well as nucleic acids can be utilized to generate ATP. The cell, for most of us couch potatoes, will generally convert the food into a carbohydrate, and then send, uh, convert the carbohydrate into glucose, and then send the glucose through aerobic respiration in the normal way. That's true if you have a high protein diet or a high lipid diet. 
that's for couch potatoes. That's not true for like an Olympic athlete or a marathon runner. But in the marathon runner, they can digest lipids directly. And I think I've stated this before, but they do not digest lipids until 45 minutes into the marathon run. For the first 45 minutes, they are digesting uh, glucose and uh, carbohydrates for the first 45 minutes of the marathon run. All right. Um, in part of the discussion of using the different proteins, lipids, carbohydrates to generate ATP, I need to talk about anabolic and cat catabolic pathways. I've talked about them as being distinct and separate pathways. In reality, they are not that. There are many common intermediates. We call these amphibolic pathways, where the metabolic pathway can function in both directions. These bridge the pathways involved in carbohydrate, lipid, protein, and nucleic acid metabolism, which I never showed you nucleic acid metabolism because we don't consume very much nucleic acid. But the nucleic acid generally, for most of us couch potatoes, will be converted into a carbohydrate like glucose and then sent through uh, aerobic respiration the normal way. Uh, this is showing you the amphibolic pathways wherever you have a double, come on mouse, chain. That means the pathway can go both ways. So in the Krebs cycle, as you can notice, it tends to come in with acetylcoenzyme A and then go this way, but it doesn't have to. Like for example, if you have certain amino acids, and these amino acids, it's only some amino acids. Some amino acids can come in uh, besides here. They can come in these steps here and maybe even one up there. Nope. So they're all right here or right there. But this amino acid will be converted on, into oxaloacetic acid. And instead of going through the Krebs cycle this way, we can actually go backwards make acetylcoenzyme A, go backwards through the glycolysis. And I don't know why, but that should be uh, uh, going both ways. And then that is how a couch potato will eat a high protein diet and then make glucose. Of course, some of the amino acids will come in the Krebs cycle here, and then we'll go backwards. And then if you were to eat a high carbohydrate diet or even a high protein diet, and you would not utilize enough of that protein, meaning you're eating too much, what are you going to do? You're going to store that down. And although initially it'll be stored down as glycolysis in your liver, uh, once you've stored enough down, uh, what are you going to do? You're going to convert that into a lipid, and then you'll store it down as fat. And so this protein will be broken down in amino acids and then will come this way. And this also is not showing uh, two uh, ways. Actually, that one is showing two ways, sorry. And then we'll come this way. And now that I think, see this, that is two ways. There's an arrow going that way and an arrow going that way. So that is going both ways. It's just a little different. And the same with this fatty acids to make lipids. And then that high protein diet will be stored as lipids. And that's true of carbohydrates too. They'll be converted this way, converted into fat and then stored as lipids. Any question about any of that? And this is what humans can do. It's pretty good. We're going essentially backwards at every step of uh, the Krebs cycle and glycolysis. Green plants are even much better than humans. And, and microbes generally are much better at humans and going uh, both ways in the chemical reactions. 
The point is, is that the amphibolic pathway bridge um, catabolism and anabolism. So we're starting with an amino acid. We can convert that into part of the Krebs cycle, go backwards, make glucose, and then make the glucose go and makes, uh, well, actually in plants, it'd be glucose to starch. Humans don't make starch that I know of. Uh, what we do is we make, um, let's see, glycolysis? No. What is our liver store? Anyone? The glycogen. Glycogen, thank you. All right. So uh, that is the amphibolic pathways. Let's briefly talk about photosynthesis. As you know, photosynthesis is conversion of light energy into chemical energy. And you all know the green plants are photosynthetic. And hopefully you know that there are photosynthetic bacteria and other microbes. And some of them are green, meaning they have chlorophyll to make them green. But some of them are photosynthetic and they have an, another color, um, photosynthetic pigment. And actually green plants, at least leaves, I don't know about other green green. Uh, plants, but at least tree leaves, we have a yellow photosynthetic pigment. And you can see that yellow color in the fall. That's why uh, the leaves may become yellow. Uh, the red is another pigment making the leaves red, but it is not photosynthetic. The point is, is that uh, you can have photosynthet photosynthesis occurring in green plants and in photosynthetic microbes. Oftentimes, the photosynthetic organism will convert the energy in light and take CO2 and fix it to make gar glucose. And this we call carbon fixation. This is performed in cyanobacteria, algae, and green plants. And without this, animals and microbes would not have an organic chemical molecule like glucose to eat. So it is required by herbivores. You need photosynthesis to make the glucose, fix the sunlight and convert that energy into chemical energy. What you probably don't know is there are two uh, photosynthetic reactions or two types of photosynthetic reactions. There's cyclic photosynthesis and non-cyclic photosynthesis. The photosynthetic reaction you've probably seen in the past is non-cyclic photosynthesis. When we generate oxygen, you do need to know this one. Uh, we take six carbon dioxide molecules and 12 water molecules plus light and you need the uh, uh, photosynthetic pigment like uh, chlorophyll to make glucose and six O2 molecules and six water molecules. Oftentimes they'll remove the six water molecule and reduce six water molecules here. I prefer showing 12 water molecules because when we look at where these 12 oxygen atoms come from, the six oxygen water molecules, the oxygen all comes from water. And so you need the 12 water to show where the oxygen came from. None of the oxygen comes from CO2. And uh, that's almost similar to photosynthesis, I mean, aerobic respiration, but we'll skip that. Uh, there is another non-cyclic photosynthesis reaction 
generating glucose. It starts with hydrogen sulfide gas and it produces sulfur. You don't need to know this reaction. I won't test you on it. You should, however, know about cyclic photosynthesis. In cyclic photosynthesis, the energy coming from light is converted into the energy that is stored as ATP, meaning the light energy phosphorylates or adds a phosphate group to ADP to make ATP. And this is all cyclic photosynthesis needs. Most, if not all, photosynthetic, photosynthetic organisms like green plants, cyanobacteria, can perform both non-cyclic photosynthesis and cyclic photosynthesis. They will engage in non-cyclic photosynthesis if they want to make glucose. And if they want to make ATP, they will engage in cyclic photosynthesis. Any questions about any of that? Uh, are the plants the same way? Say again. The plants can engage in both as well? Yeah, green plants can engage in both photosynthetic uh, reactions, both cyclic and non-cyclic, depending on what they need. If they need ATP, they engage in cyclic photosynthesis. If they need glucose, or they want to store the glucose, then they engage in non-cyclic photosynthesis. Let's talk a little bit more about non, I mean, uh, cyclic photosynthesis. Uh, light excites the electrons from chlorophyll. And that happens in the photosystem one. You don't really need to know that. But the electrons flow out of the chlorophyll. The electrons flow to this protein in a membrane, to this protein in a membrane, to that protein in a membrane, and then they flow to this protein in the photosystem, and then they return to the chlorophyll. That is why this is called cyclic uh, photosynthesis or cyclic photophosphorylation, because the electron flows in a cycle. It ends up where it started. Along the way, the electron gives this protein the energy it needs to pump hydrogen ions from this side of the membrane to that side of the membrane. This hydrogen ions then makes a two-fold gradient. There's more hydrogen on this side of the membrane than that side. There's more positive charges on this side of the membrane than that side. The hydrogen ions will want to move by diffusion from this side of the membrane to that side of the membrane, but they can't move through the lipid bilayer of the membrane. And what do they do? They move through this channel protein. And as the hydrogen ions move through the channel protein, it gives the protein the energy it needs to make ATP. So this channel protein is ATP synthase, an enzyme which makes ATP. And that is how cyclic photosynthesis makes ATP. For uh, eukaryotes, this is going to be the inner membrane of the chloroplast. And that will be in the space in between the inner and the outer membrane of the chloroplast. In uh, prokaryotes, this membrane is the cell membrane. And this will be outside the cell, like the cell wall. And uh, the hydrogen ions will move back into the cell through this channel protein, which is in the cell membrane. All right, any question about any of this? No, let's make a brief summary of the making of ATP. The energy source can vary. For photosynthesis, the energy source can come from the sun, the light energy in the sun. For organisms which metabolize glucose, 
the energy comes from glucose or some carbohydrate that's converted into glucose or some other molecule that's usually converted into glucose, although that might not be the case. The electrons then flow. There can be different electron carriers. We're not going to talk about that one. This one is only seen in, in photosynthesis. These are seen in aerobic respiration and anaerobic respiration. Some of them in, are NADH in uh, fermentation as well. The electron acceptor can vary. For aerobic respiration, the electrons flow towards oxygen. So that's the final electron acceptor. In anaerobic respiration, the electrons flow to an inorganic chemical compound like nitrate, sulfate, or iron. Uh, and then you can have the electrons flow to an organic common compound that's fermentation. And then, of course, with uh, cyclic photosynthesis, which is not shown here, the electrons flow back to the chlorophyll. So they return from where they started. Any question about any of that? All right, that's it for chapter five. Let me begin chapter six. So this is the initial slide that I normally show you for a chapter, giving you the major goals in the rough outline. As always, know the terms. We're going to talk about all of these terms, understand the various requirements that cells have for growth, understand the four phases of growth, and compare the different methods we have for measuring microbial growth. Any questions about what we're going to do? Let's see if this will work. I'll be opening a different browser. There we go. Bacteria reproduce very simply and rapidly by doubling their contents and splitting in two. Just one bacterium, dividing every 20 minutes, could produce nearly 5,000 billion billion bacteria in one day. All right, any questions about any of that? Okay, Chief from St. Farm, I really want that person. All cells have various requirements for growth. We're going to talk about microbes and their requirements for growth. Cells have physical requirements and chemical requirements. The physical requirements re include the temperature the cell requires to grow, the pH the cell requires to grow, the osmotic pressure or the salinity the cell requires to grow. The chemical requirements include Sources of carbon, all cells require a source of carbon, a source of nitrogen, a source of sulfur, a source of phosphate or phosphorus. Uh, cells require trace elements, usually in small amounts. Cells may require oxygen. They certainly have an oxygen requirement, meaning even an anaerobe that cannot survive with oxygen present. That's its requirement for growing, and that is the absence of oxygen. And then some cells have organic growth factors. These would be biological molecules that the cell requires to grow. Vitamin C would be a organic growth factor that humans require to grow. Any question about any of that? All right, let's talk about the physical requirements. Temperature, each species has its own minimum, maximum, and optimal temperature for growth. We can actually classify organisms based upon their preferred temperature range. 
we have sacrophiles, and these are organisms which live in the refrigerator or below, and their optimum is around 10 degrees Celsius, which is refrigeration uh, temperatures between four degrees Celsius and 10 degrees Celsius. There are psychotrophs. These organisms prefer to grow at room temperature or around that temperature. There are mesophiles. Their preferred temperature is around 37 degrees. All human pathogens are mesophiles. Any question about that? Then there are thermophiles. These are organisms that grow in various warm or hot environments. Uh, this is showing you the optimum temperature being between 60 and 65. And then there are hyperthermophiles, a category of organisms that was not even known when I took microbiology. These organisms grow best around 95 degrees Celsius. And remember that 100 degrees Celsius is the temperature that water boils at. You should know that these are various classification systems are not rigidly defined. A mesophile doesn't have to grow at 37 as is optimal temperature. And it could survive and grow less than 10 degrees. So the range is not true for all mesophiles. Um, for example, I, this one I know that Micrococcus luteus, which, which grows on the human skin, does not have an optimal temperature at 37. The optimal temperature is cooler than that. And I forget if it's 30 or 32 degrees Celsius, but it's cooler, the important point, than 37. We still call it a mesophile even though its optimum is not at 37 degrees. Any question about any of that? All right. When we're talking about temperature, you should realize that, let's see if I can blow this up. Uh, there is a temperature range that we call the danger zone, where if food is left out uh, and microbes can grow in it, after just a few hours, the food can become contaminated. And this is between generally about 15, 16 degrees Celsius to 52 degrees Celsius, which is something like 60 degrees Fahrenheit to close to 130 degrees Fahrenheit, where we have rapid growth of bacteria. Some of these may produce toxins. So even if we put the food in the refrigerator, the toxin is there and it can be toxic to you. Uh, above those ranges, we have a narrow range where bacteria can grow although slower, and then below that we have a range that bacteria can grow, although slower. And as you can notice, bacteria can grow all the way down to zero degrees. Uh, generally at zero degrees, we have no further growth below zero because the cell freezes and there can be no metabolism, no cellular growth, if the cell is frozen. Now for uh, some organisms that live in cold environments, they will produce an antifreeze and they can grow at lower than zero degrees Celsius because they produce an antifreeze, they're not frozen at that temperature. But if you cool it further, eventually that cell will freeze, and then metabolism will stop. Any question about any of that? 
Um, food spoilage usually happens when the food is not put in the refrigerator soon enough or it is too slow at cooling, such as when you put it in a big batch and you freeze the large batch, the food inside the batch will, will cool at a slower rate and then the bacteria may grow in a big batch. Uh, in a smaller batch, the food can co cool quickly. And so in about an hour, uh, we get the bacteria uh, not growing depending on what the bacteria is and how quickly the food cools. All right. Some other physical requirements include the pH. In the lab, most microbes grow best around pH 7. So we say the range is somewhere between pH 6 and pH 8. And below that range, the microbe usually grows slower if it grows at all. Um, and this is why we put pH buffers in our media that's used in the lab. And that's because most organisms will ferment the complex molecules in the media and fermentation generates an acid. So we put the pH buffer in there to prevent the buildup of acids, which if you get the environment too acidic, then our bacteria cannot grow. Yeah. Molds and yeast actually prefer growing in an acidic environment, and they grow best between pH 5 and 6, and that's different from bacteria. You should know that when we're talking about the pH, we have some organisms which grow at extreme pH such as acetophiles, organisms which grow in an acidic environment. Uh, the most acidic organism that we've discovered, which grows in very high acidity, is uh, acetophiles that grow in a volcanic vent. The volcanic vent can have a pH between pH zero and pH three. Remember pH seven is normal pH where the hydrogen ions equal the OH ions in the dissolving solvent. Any questions about any of that? Microbes require a certain amount of salinity, which usually results in a certain osmotic pressure, but you could have osmotic pressure from something other than table salt. You could have it from like sugar. And when you dry fruit, we actually can prefer, preserve that fruit because of the high sugar content and the low moisture content of the dried fruit. The high osmotic pressure removes necessary water from a cell. Let me show you this. So initially the cytoplasm is up against the cell wall. When you put it in a hypertonic environment where the solution concentration is much higher outside than inside the cell, water will flow out of the cell like this, resulting in plasmolysis where osmotic pressure has the water leave the cell, and then the cytoplasm scrunches up, moving away from the cell wall to in here. And that can kill cells. For cells like E. coli and most other gram-negative rods, if they don't have an endospore, the cell can easily dry. It depends how many cells you have, but let's just say in a day or two, most of the cells will die under high osmotic pressure. So we can use high osmotic pressure to preserve food, such as, like I said, dried uh, fruit. Uh, molasses, 
salted meats. These are all examples of using high osmotic pressure to preserve the food. And as I mentioned, our bottle of molasses, my mother had a bottle of molasses for at least 30 years. And it was good, even though it had been open and bacteria fell into it. It was good because of high osmotic pressure. And she kept the bottle at room temperature. I didn't mention that. But uh, it looked like it was good after 30 years. And after 30 years, my mother finally threw it away because she realized she wasn't going to be using it. And the last time it was used was 10 years earlier when the bottle was about 20 years old. I made my father molasses candy out of it. Uh, halophiles are organisms which grow in high salt. We have two types of halophiles. A halophile literally means salt lover. Uh, we have obligate health halophiles, and they require high salt concentrations to grow, such as the microorganisms growing in the Dead Sea. They tend to be obligate halophiles, and they have the highest salt concentration possible because if you don't know, the Dead Sea can reach 30% sodium chloride. That's as high as you can get in uh, water, at least at standard temperature and pressure. Above that, the salt will precipitate out of solution. Anyways, there are obligate halophiles. They require high salt solutions to grow. And then there are facultative halophiles. They do not require high salt concentrations to grow, but they can tolerate greater than 2% sodium chloride. And the facultative halophiles can grow up to 15% sodium chloride. And you can go higher than that, like um, Staphylococcus aureus is usually called a, a facultative halophile because it does not require high salt concentrations to grow. It can grow in at least 1% sodium chloride and maybe less, I've never tried, but it does grow on triptych soy auger, which is, it's actually 0.0, Let's see, 0.9% sodium chloride, which is isotonic. And sodium chloride can grow. I mean, not sodium chloride. Staphylococcus aureus can grow. And it can grow on your skin. And our skin can be up to 20% sodium chloride. So Staphylococcus aureus can grow up to 20% sodium chloride. We also have hypotonic solutions, low osmotic pressure. Water will tend to enter those cells. If the cell does not have a cell wall, the water will expand the cell membrane, expand it until the cell membrane pops, and that would kill the cell. And that is why a cell wall, if it is intact, can protect the cell membrane from osmotic lysis. The cell membrane will stop expanding once the cell membrane touches the cell wall. It can't expand any further. That will limit water moving into the cell. No more water can move into the cell once that happens. <clears throat> any questions about any of that? Okay. Carbon is a chemical requirement. All cells require a carbon source. Typically, half of a cell's dry weight is from carbon. The dry weight is the weight of the cells once the water has been removed. So regardless of what the cell is, half of the dry weight typically is carbon. Cells use carbon as structural organic molecules they use carbon for an energy source. I mean, we use glucose, for example, and we burn the glucose, burning the carbons. 
a heterotrophs use an organic carbon molecule. Autotrophs can get their carbon directly from CO2, either in the air or the CO2 dissolved in the water. All living organisms have a requirement for nitrogen. Nitrogen makes up about 14% of the dry weight of cells. And this is essentially all cells. Nitrogen is in, of course, amino acids and protein. It's also in DNA, RNA, and ATP. We obtain our nitrogen by decomposition of a biological molecule, such as degrading proteins, degrading nucleic acids. But many bacteria can get their nitrogen directly from ammonium ion, or some from nitrate ion, or some other nitrogen source. A few bacteria can even use nitrogen gas that they get from the air. And these we call nitrogen-fixing bacteria. They pull nitrogen down from the air and then make that nitrogen available to other organisms in the soil or in the ocean, wherever the microbe is. And usually what happens is that organism will take the nitrogen gas, convert it into a nitrogen compound like amino acids, and then, uh, and they may use an intermediate like making a nitrate group and then using that to make the organic chemical compound. And then uh, the nitrogen becomes available when that cell dies. And then other organisms can use that nitrogen source. All right, any questions about nitrogen? Sulfur, another chemical requirement. We need sulfur in certain amino acids like cysteine and methionine. Uh, sulfur is also required in thiamine and biotin. These are two B vitamins. And we have sulfur in uh, DNA and RNA. Uh, many organisms attain their sulfur from decomposition of a biological molecule, like a protein. And that's how we obtain most of our sulfur. But bacteria have many different sources of sulfur. They can get used, some bacteria can use sulfate. And you'll look on uh, uh, fertilizer, if it's a chemical fertilizer, they usually have sulfate in there. The number one ingredient is actually nitrate in the fertilizer. But sulfate's an important ingredient of the fertilizer. Some bacteria can get uh, sulfur from hydrogen sulfate as a sulfur source. And then many bacteria like E. coli can get it from degrading a protein, although uh, E. coli, I think, can use sulfate. Phosphorus, another chemical that's required for growth. Phosphorus is in DNA, RNA, ATP, and then in the um, lipophosphate, or lipophosphate, which is in the cell membrane. Do I have that right? Lipoprotein? Uh, most organisms can use phosphate as their source of phosphorus, including humans, we can use phosphate. phosphate. And certainly most microbes can use phosphate. You can get phosphate from 
either DNA, RNA, or ATP. Most organisms do have trace elements. These are inorganic elements required by microbes in small amounts. And they require this for the health of the organism, the growth and reproduction. Most microbes, as well as people, get their trace elements from their environment. Like we get our trace elements from the food we eat and the liquids we consume. An example being What is it they put in the table of salt? I'm dropping a blank here. Iodine? It's iodine. Thank you. Uh, we get that from salt, iodized salt, and uh, it's a trace element. If you live in an environment where you get iodine in the soil or in the water, you could get it from the soil or the water. But we're in western Washington or western Oregon. And because of all of the rain, our soil is low on iodine. And so we do need a source of iodine. We would not get enough trace iodine if we were to only eat food grown in our own soil. Uh, the trace elements are often required as enzyme cofactors. Some example of trace elements that are required include iron, copper, and zinc. And then the example I gave was iodine. All right, any question about the trace elements? Let's talk about organic growth factors. These are biological molecules that are required by an organism in order to live and reproduce so you need the organic growth factor to maintain your health. Without it, you'd get sick and then die. Uh, organic compounds are usually obtained from the environment. Uh, we get our organic growth factors from the food we eat and sometimes from the liquid we drink, like orange juice uh, provides vitamin C. You could also eat the orange. That would be from the food we eat or pineapple for vitamin C. Most of the vitamins are growth factors. There are a few other growth factors. Uh, sometimes essential amino acids like lysine is an essential amino acid for humans. So that would be a growth factor. We have to get that in our diet. And usually we have enough protein that we get lysine in our diet. And there are some essential fatty acids that we must get in our diet. And if we don't get these growth factors, we'll get sick and then die. An example being vitamin C, as well as most of the vitamins. There are a few exceptions, though, like vitamin D. We can make, assuming we have the precursors, and we get exposure uh, of our skin to the sun. All right, any question about the organic growth factors? If not, I'm going to stop here and I will continue uh, with this lesson next time. And I'll see you at 6.30 for the lab. All right, bye.